When Jessica Berman took over as NWSL Commissioner in early 2022, she took over an organisation that had been rocked to its core. Her predecessor Lisa Baird had resigned amid a player abuse scandal and the game's biggest stars were calling for heads to roll in the front office. Now, just two years on, the NWSL seems to be in a far better place. There are two new teams joining this year, one at a record expansion fee, after two joined last year too. And this year there's a whole raft of new TV deals bringing a fresh influx of cash into the game. I was lucky enough to speak to Berman for an extensive and exclusive interview. I hope you enjoy. I thought I'd like to start, given that we're so close now to the new season, with a question about the Challenge Cup, actually. Maybe not the place that most people thought this conversation would start, but how come that's changed in format this year? I know previously it was a little mini tournament and now it's become more of a Super Cup. Yeah, well, I think it was introduced during covid as the original return of the league. And we were actually the first league to return in COVID, which obviously predates me, but something we're really proud of. And year over year, we've iterated on the format of the Challenge Cup, being open to innovation and new ideas and the ways to make it better as compared to the prior season. And so this past year, I think we learned that certainly having it played through our season was better than it would have been if we had done it as we had the year prior at the start of the season. But we also learned that our clubs were interested in having it be something that had even more meaning. And we have the Shield winner, the championship winner, and that there was an opportunity to have them essentially have like a showdown, like the Community Shield, taking a page out of the playbook of the international game. We also know that As we think about alternative tournaments, our clubs are very interested in being tested against international clubs. And we know that the days of having a Women's Club World Cup are likely coming in the foreseeable future. And so we haven't announced details yet, but we have shared that we are going to do an in-season tournament with international component to be determined what that will be. And it will sit within our summer window where we are not going to be playing regular season games during the Olympics. And so we've sort of split the concept of the Challenge Cup and having an in-season tournament into two separate things, each accomplishing different objectives. Is that going to be like an intercontinental tournament? So like teams from Canada, teams from Mexico, other Central American, maybe some Caribbean nations? Or is it you going to be inviting, is that going to be truly international, a bit of a precursor to a Women's World Cup? We're still finalizing all the details, so can't really share yet what it's going to look like. But this year will be our toe in the water. So we hope it's the first of additional activities that we'll do in the international space. Was that driven by your clubs or was that something that you looked at the market and thought there's a gap here? Both. I mean, we know that our clubs have arranged friendlies historically and that sometimes they actually have a big draw. We also know that as the league and the centralized operation of the NWSL, that we have the opportunity to create games of consequence that matter more than a friendly. And so we at the direction of our board, identify that as an opportunity, knowing that we run a 12, now 14 team league, and there's an opportunity to bring in international teams and allow for our clubs to continue to be tested, particularly as we look at the ways in which the global game has continued to evolve and grow, and that there's real competition at other international clubs that could be exciting for our fans and for our players. You mentioned there that you've grown out to 14 teams. I think that's probably, aside from the media rights deal, which I'd like to discuss a little bit later on too, that's probably the biggest change going into the new season, right? You've got Bay FC coming in and also the return of the Utah Royals. What does that do for the NWSL? A couple of things. Number one, and probably most imminent, is that we're expanding our geographic footprint. I think one of the distinguishing factors of running a global sport in the United States is that the geography of our country is just so different from most of the world. We cross three time zones. We have six hour flights between New York and San Diego or between Orlando and Seattle. And that is what 
European teams experience only for like a Champions League game or something like that. It's not something that... Barely even for that. If you're flying to Kazakhstan from London, right. yeah, that's pretty much it. And so, you know, on a week over week basis, that is just something that is part of what we have to recognize. And so being able to have more teams across our geography allows us to do a couple of things. Number one, it allows us to have the ability to facilitate other games where there's less travel, right? Because in theory, there's proximity between clubs, the more clubs you have. And so it reduces the amount of travel week over week, but also allows us to occupy more of the major markets from a media perspective in terms of DMA. And so when you look at adding a city like San Francisco, the Bay Area, that is a massive media market. Utah Salt Lake City is actually one of the fastest growing cities in our country in terms of the number of people who are moving there every day post pandemic. And so for those reasons, there's huge opportunity. I'd say secondly, and this is really more about sort of like the macro view and more of a long term view, it gave us the opportunity to reset the value of women's soccer. By running a proper process where we were selling an expansion team, as you probably know, historically, the prior expansion team sold for $5 million, and we were able to sell actually two teams for $53 million. And so with that, we've now set a new benchmark for what an NWSL team is worth, which is obviously translated to, in the context of team sales, we've seen multiple teams trade and that value has continued to hold and most recently Portland sold for $60 million. And so continuing to build on that. And so expansion allows for the league to drive higher enterprise value as we think about our team franchise valuations. Sure. And you, I mean, you've got potentially another one coming in after that too, don't you? A 16th franchise. I know there's, it's kind of been only briefly talked about so far. Have you, have you got media markets in mind for that? What's the sort of interest been like on that franchise? Yeah, we have 59 groups in active conversations right now across our country. Wow. I know it's hard to imagine. It's a lot of emails. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully we have an investment bank in our circle sports that's helping us to manage that. That is a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails. We're in the process of sort of vetting those interested bidders to determine what's real, what's not real, and getting groups that have real interests that we think have real viability under NDA to get them into our data room. And so I believe we have 11 groups under NDA right now who are in active due diligence for one spot. And so very exciting, the level of interest. In terms of markets, because our country is so large, our decision-making filters will be less driven by market and more driven by ownership group and facilities because there are many markets, frankly, that we could see our league expanding into as we think about the next five to 10 years. We have the ability to be a little bit more open-minded and flexible in terms of the market and much more focused on the quality of ownership, both in terms of values alignment and financial wherewithal, as well as the facilities for both playing games and training. In terms of like how that compares to previous processes that the league has run, is that like more interest in that 16 franchise than you've had before? Well, I've only can speak to the last two years. I don't know that we've run a process before I was here. And I believe that process matters. It actually creates the market for determining whether there's competitive tension and greater interest in whatever it is that you're selling. And so it's actually quite similar in volume to the last process we ran for Team 14 and ultimately Team 15. And so, you know, we're seeing the same level of interest with, I think, higher level of filter because when we ran the process in 2022, the last team had sold for $5 million. So there were a lot of people who were interested who might not be at the standard that we were expecting because we had to right size the quality of owners and the amount of capital that would be available. Because we've sold multiple teams for more than $50 million, it acts as an appropriate filter where no one is coming to the table who thinks they're getting a team for $5 million or $10 million or frankly, anything um, even close to what we sold it before. And so that acts as an important screening mechanism so that we're not wasting anyone's time 
And the people who are coming forward are people who have real resources who understand the long-term value of this investment. You sort of mentioned a couple of the base criteria for what you want from uh, like th- these new expansion partners. Do you feel like the more recent teams that have come into the league, the Agile Cities, who obviously have their incredible partnership model and I think they were valued at more than 100 million as a, as a team in the enterprise value. San Diego Wave, who've done a really good job in terms of getting in fans into their stadium at Snapdragon. I mean, even like Bay FC coming in, I think it was today that they announced that they'd made the record signing ever in women's football um, in terms of transfer value. Yeah. Have they set a standard for what you want an owner to be like in the NWSL now? I mean, because those are all very different approaches. We value the different approaches. In our model, there are lots of paths that our owners can choose to take. Ultimately, we focus on our standards of excellence and our minimum requirements for making sure that the team is resourced properly, both from a business as well as from a competitive perspective. So thinking about quality of coaches, number of coaches, quality of the pitch, all on the competition side, making sure there is appropriate resourcing for making sure the players have a positive, healthy, and safe work environment. And then on the business side, making sure that there is appropriate investment and resources in ticket sales and sponsorship sales and social media. Because I think one of our superpowers that we've demonstrated as a really important differentiator is that we value our competitiveness across the league, both in terms of being able to have parity on the pitch so that every game matters and across the league, having consistency in terms of attendance. And we saw this past season that we raised average attendance to 10,000 per game across the regular season, across all 12 markets. And that's really important to us. We want from both a business perspective and from the player's perspective, them to know that no matter what game they're playing in, that they can expect a competitive match and that they can expect approximately 10,000 fans to show up and cheer for them. And that's really important to us in terms of the model that we're putting forward. 10,000 fans in stadiums is something that's like really visually important, I think, as well to fans watching as a TV product too. Speaking about the WSL here, like you'll see a WSL game in a Premier League stadium and it looks amazing when there's lots and lots of fans there, but it doesn't look amazing when there's not. That facilities element, is it about finding the appropriate level of venue too? So you're not like running before you can walk? It's a balance, right? I think in part, we want to have facilities that set the standard for where we want to be, even if we're not quite there yet. But of course, you don't want to have an empty venue. It's been our experience that when you play in small venues, that fans don't value the sport or the experience the way they otherwise might. So there are just basic minimum standards that we expect of our clubs, no matter where they are in their journey of building their season ticket holder base or building their community of fans. But there is a point at which we don't want it to get too far ahead of where they are in terms of their community. Probably the biggest stadium where we play, which is maybe more analogous to some of those Premier League stadiums, is the Seattle Reign, who play in Lumen Field, which holds, I think, close to 70,000. It's an NFL stadium, in fact, although MLS Seattle Sounders play there as well. And we really are working towards selling out on a consistent basis that lower bowl, which is around 20,000. And they've done it several times last season, including for the playoffs, including actually needing to open the upper bowl for Megan Rapinoe's last regular season home game. So having it as like a goal allows our clubs to be challenged and stretched to know that that's our expectation of them. We don't allow our teams to play in any venues that are less than 10,000 seats. How much like influence do you have or even guidance do you give new franchises when they're coming into the league in terms of like, this is kind of what we expect. We can help you with these things. Like would Angel City, for example, or San Diego Wave, who've been successful, share how that happens with the new franchises coming in? Or would you be like, no, it's okay. Like you guys are owners. There's a reason we've given you this brief. We trust you to kind of get on with it. Yeah, no, I think it's it's the former. And we actually view the league as playing an important role in facilitating the sharing of best practices. But of course, where there are obvious success stories and proofs of concept and, you know, Angel City in the sponsorship space is clearly a proof of concept 
and anyone in our league, and it often happens that they reach out to Angel City to learn and understand how they've sold the value of that team. I think it's been widely reported that they have over $30 million in sponsorship revenue. It's pretty incredible, even if you compare them to longstanding, decades-old men's sports leagues. And if you look at San Diego and their ticket sales, it's pretty obvious that they've done a really good job. And so um, whether it's the league facilitating the sharing of best practices or our teams picking up the phone and working directly peer to peer, that best practice sharing is happening quite often. And we view it holistically around the league as the rising tide lifting all boats. And so it's really important to Angel City and San Diego that all of our teams get to where they are in the areas where they've excelled because that'll help them to continue to grow the value of their franchise as well. Julie Ehrman came to our event in Madrid last year and we actually recently published our podcast with her. How much of a great resource is it to have someone like that who you can go to? It's incredibly valuable, whether it's Julie Ehrman or even now you look at someone like Michelle Kang, who's investing globally in teams around the world and her willingness to sort of bring forward the things that she's learned. You look at Chris and Angie Long, who are opening the first ever purpose-built stadium for women, and they have hosted all of our clubs, actually, to understand and learn the ways in which that they financed that stadium, how they came up with the plans, how they worked with the city, the permitting process. All of our clubs have really been an open book with each other. And yeah, I I do think it's a little bit different than the men's side. You know, I have learned about this a little bit through my work as the co-chair of the Women's League Forum, which is sort of sister entity to the World Leagues Forum, which I'm sure you're familiar, is the trade association that convenes all of the men's professional soccer leagues to talk about issues of common interest. And when you compare that to the women's leagues and the way that I think all of us internationally, even though we compete for talent, are willing and open to sharing best practices, recognizing that it really is not a zero-sum game. We are collectively working towards getting our share of the pie from an industry-wide perspective, and we all view each other's success as all of our success. And I do think that that is unique and a differentiator. And we all talk all the time. You know, we're on email threads, we're on WhatsApp threads. I'm actually gonna be in London later this month at the Financial Times Business of Football Summit. And I'll be spending time in person with the WSL and others over there. And when they come over here, we host them in our office. We really do believe that It's our collective action and our collective mission to ensure that women's football grows to where it should be. You've kind of got out ahead a little bit of a question I was going to ask about how competitive you are with, well, especially the the leagues in Europe and namely the WSL, which you guys are sort of one and two when it comes to like domestic club football competitions. Do you see that in the same way that you refer to your ownership, like your ownership groups as in a riding tide at this stage? And following on from that, Is there going to be a point where actually you have to start seeing them as competitors because there is that's that's just the way these things work yeah i know we we do see the collective as a rising tide lifting all boats and frankly knowing the history of this sport women's football the players deserve to have optionality and that will keep all of us investing in the right ways to make sure that we're providing the best possible environment for them to train and play. The more we grow and can make our businesses viable and sustainable and make our businesses thrive, the more revenue we have, the more we can pay our players. It becomes a virtuous cycle that allow for all of our businesses to grow. And so, I don't know, I I guess Maybe it'll be a good thing when we all feel like we have enough market share collectively that we need to change our approach. Right now, we feel like we're trying to work together to 
make sure that the sport gets the visibility that it needs in order for mainstream media to pay attention to this incredible sport and these incredible athletes. I know we're here to talk about the NWSL, but the WSL is going through an interesting phase right now with that shift to a new model. In those advice sessions, when you're talking to them, how much have you spoken to them about that, to Nikki, Nuco and the FA, about what you guys have learned and how that might be relevant? Yeah, I, I have a monthly call with Nikki and we we talk a lot about some of our shared challenges, shared opportunities. There's a lot I could learn from her to the extent there is ways for me to share how I've handled or navigated situations or the history of our league. We've really had a very collaborative, open dialogue, recognizing that they are at this pivotal moment and the next, I would say, probably 12 to 18 months are gonna be really important for their future. And if we want to build the value of the sport, knowing that there's going to be a Club World Cup, the more interest there is globally, the better it is for all of us. You look at even this most recent transfer window, the reason that it's gotten so much attention globally, that we've brought in 22 players from top European clubs is because those European clubs are getting attention from their local markets. And so it becomes more meaningful that we're bringing those players in. If we had done that, Eight years ago, when no one was paying attention globally, no one would have paid attention to the way that we're accessing the transfer market. And having the transfer market grow, I believe there was a report about the increase in transfer fees globally having gone up so significantly year over year. The market is growing. That will provide the business case and the investment thesis for our clubs and clubs around the world to invest in talent because the way the men's game has evolved. If the talent that you're developing have value and there's a transfer market, that'll help us to unlock incremental investment. Let's talk about the the new rights deal um, or deals uh, in particular. It came off the back of what was a quite strong final season with your last set of deals. I think it was more than 800,000 viewers for CBS for the championship game and generally sort of pretty strong average audiences throughout the year. I'm not expecting you to give me exact numbers, but have you got expectations what you want out of the new partnerships? Well, our goal with our new media deal was really to primarily focus on increased exposure and reach. So we want our games to be discoverable. We want our games to be in the places and spaces where people consume content. And we curated a partnership with these four media companies, knowing that each of them are focused on a slightly different audience. And so we feel like it allows for us to reach entirely new and different demographics than is our core fan base. One of the key objectives of our new media deal was to scale the number of games that have national distribution. And so if you look at, for example, the 2023 season, We had six games on CBS, what we call like CBS proper, that is widely distributed in almost every home. This year, we're going from that was six games to over 100 games that are going to be nationally distributed in broadcast, whether it's on CBS, Amazon, Scripps Ion, or ESPN slash ABC. And so that is going to be the key differentiator for us. And so the things that we're paying most attention to is aggregate audience, aggregate eyeballs, the number of humans that have been able to discover or experience our game that wouldn't have otherwise been able to. So we're paying attention to that. We're paying attention to the more qualitative demographic analysis. So like literally who is coming into our ecosystem, how can we capture them and bring them along on the fan journey. And then, yeah, of course, looking at the the ratings game for each game and making sure that we're holding our audience and all of those sorts of metrics. But this year is really the first year of this important new media rights cycle where we have a lot that we need to deploy and it's not going to be easy to educate our fans about where to watch our games. That's the sort of downside of having four media partners is that it's a bit harder to navigate. I guess, fortunately, I think most sports fans have grown accustomed to having their games in lots of different places. And so I know, for example, in my house, no matter what the sport is, if my kids want to watch a game specifically, they just 
open Google and look up where the game is going to be on because they actually <laughs> don't know what platform to look at. It used to be that if you were watching a particular sport, you knew that it was on X platform because there was a partnership that existed and it included all the games. And it's just not the case anymore. Almost every sports league has multiple partners now. The space has just become extremely fragmented, as you know. Yeah, that's the challenge of the digital age. The platform used to just be the box in the corner of the room, right? You press on and that's where it came out of. Now it's, is it a phone? Is it a streaming service? You've got kind of all of that in this deal. You've also got two like main commercial networks in ABC and CBS. Like, was that something that you really targeted was having those like nationally available people could literally pick them up on the bunny as kind of networks? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would add Scripps Ion to that, which is on every single television. In fact, even if you don't have any service, if you just plug in your TV, it is on as well. So we look at those as being an important component of our distribution strategy. And we also are thinking about the ways in which we reach people on, for example, ESPN, even though that is cable, because that is where the sports fan goes to watch. And Amazon Prime being the place of choice as we think about streaming in particular. And they've built such a following around their Thursday night football, knowing that we're going to be Friday night football gives us the halo of what Amazon has to offer their consumers from a streaming perspective. I can say from personal experience that Amazon as a Premier League broadcaster was my favorite Premier League broadcaster. Ask them what they did there and get make sure that's it because the Americans will love it. You, you talked about the challenges of, of having that split. What kind of things are you putting in place to overcome those? What's the What is the communication around making sure that people can see the games that they want to? Yeah, well, we're doing two things and they're both important. But the first thing that is most important is that as part of our negotiation, we communicated to all of our partners that it was table stakes that they commit to promoting not just our games on their own platform, but to cross promoting with the other platforms, which is very non-traditional. It's very rare that you see CBS promoting to ABC or ABC promoting to Amazon. But we got all four of these partners to commit to promoting us, not just institutionally with their own games, but cross-promoting to each other. And that is the single most important thing that will help us be set up for success. Of course, we also have our own investments in promoting TuneIn. And fortunately, we have a team of people who come from other sports leagues where their games were on multiple platforms. In particular, our chief marketing and commercial officer, Julie Haddon, came from the NFL. And this was her job. She was the marketing person who worked most closely with NFL media. And her primary focus was on ensuring that fans knew when, where, and how to watch. And so obviously in our own ways, we're importing a lot of those best practices and using those to educate our own fans on our own platforms, as well as paid media, and then holding our partners accountable to help us with that. Sorry to interrupt your podcast, but if you haven't heard, we are heading to Manhattan for Sports Pro New York. On the 18th and 19th of March, you can hear from industry innovators such as LPGA Tour Commissioner Molly Marcus Saman, David Gandler, the CEO of Fubo TV, and Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark. Come to be inspired and learn how to successfully navigate the major opportunities in modern sports media. Book your place today at newyork.sportspro.com and listeners to this podcast can get 20% off by using code PODCAST at checkout. Terms and conditions apply and this offer is not applicable to pre-existing purchases. One of the things that's sort of often discussed is that WSL players are asked to do a lot in terms of promoting the game. They are the biggest influencers in terms of driving attention. Is that something you think about too? I mean, I know like it's slightly different because you've got the collective bargaining agreement, which sets out much sort of more stringent terms of what a player is asked to do. But are they involved in this conversation? Are they part of this marketing effort too? Yeah. I mean, players who are focused on helping us to grow the ecosystem are doing a lot of that work. And I think the biggest change we saw last season relative to prior seasons is that our players now, because of the focus we've 
had on creating a positive, healthy, and safe environment for them to be able to train and play. In turn, like you'd expect in a true partnership, our players are invested in our league and they want for the league to be successful. And so if you follow our players on social, you will see that they are promoting ticket sales, they're promoting tune-in, they're going to community events. And, you know, I don't know what the culture is like around men's football, but I can say in the U.S., having spent my entire career working in men's sports in hockey, football, baseball, and basketball, it is expected that players engage in promoting the sport and promoting the league and promoting their teams. Maybe that's not typical in global men's football, but here, because a lot of our culture is around building enterprise value, there is an expectation around that that is pretty much a cultural norm. And it is part of what's in our CBA as well. For sure. You mentioned there, well, you started talking there about the kind of the player safety element of this. Obviously, you joined at a time when that was really under scrutiny for a variety of different reasons. Do you feel like the NWSL's heard and reacted to what players were saying around some of those issues with owners and coaches? It's obviously going to be something that you address all the time. But do you feel like they've kind of reacted well to what the league's done? A hundred percent. And it's probably the thing I'm most proud of. I will sort of validate what you just said, which is it never will be a one and done. We haven't like checked the box and now we don't pay attention to it. In fact, it's always on our list of top priorities to make sure that we have intentional and strategic focus on creating positive, healthy and safe work environments for our players to train and play. That being said, the wholesale seismic difference right now relative to when I joined the league 18 months ago is night and day. We have instituted systemic reform as of the last 18 months that have set up, for example, anonymous reporting lines where we have and measure how quickly we can respond and address questions or concerns to the extent something needs an investigation, conduct an investigation, manage any discipline or corrective action, do it in a way that respects the player's interest and provides a fair and just process. We do consistent education and training for the entire ecosystem. So this is for players to understand what is and isn't appropriate conduct in the workplace so that they have a clear understanding of when they should let us know when something is not right. And then on the flip side, also educating the technical staff about those same levels of expectation and making sure that we're offering tools and resources to coaches who historically haven't necessarily been told what's expected of them. And recognizing that there's a long history that lives outside of the NWSL in girls and women's sports about the ways in which players have been treated that we are trying to sort of influence and course correct. And so really intentional with our programmatic efforts, meeting people where they are, letting them know that we have subject matter experts, both internally and externally, who are available for anyone who needs support. I guess the proof of concept is that people are using our systems. So we will actually get calls from coaches where they say, hey, I'm having a really tough time with a particular player. I've tried this strategy in terms of how to give feedback, that strategy, and it's not working. And it seems to be escalating. I'd like some help. And we have partners who will engage to work directly with those coaches. The analog to that is if a player calls us and says, hey, like I really don't feel comfortable with the way I'm being spoken to or the way I'm being treated or this language that's being used in the locker room, and we will investigate it and then address it and hold people accountable. Create an environment where people understand that we're here to support them and work with them and make sure that everybody is set up for success. So I've been super proud of of the way that our league has responded to what was a pretty tough set of circumstances. Do you feel like the, the, a lot of those problems arise from the fact that staff around the teams have come into women's football from men's football where expectations around that kind of behavior are really different um that there's an education process there it could be i actually find that most of it comes from 
the youth game around how girls are treated in that a lot of our challenges actually are rooted in systemic culture of abuse as it relates to sexism in the world that is not specific necessarily to the NWSL, but is infused into cultural norms that once we reach a level of professionalism where these players understand and know that that's not acceptable, there is a moment of reckoning where it's like, I don't know why anyone thinks it's appropriate to speak to me this way. Yet when they look back at their childhood and see the way they were treated throughout their entire playing career, there is a sort of, like I said, a reckoning where there is an understanding that perhaps this hasn't been appropriate for a very long time, but it's been sort of indoctrinated as a a cultural norm. Um, So I actually think it's more of that than anything else. And we're actually starting to see, there were a few examples of this actually in the US in the last year or so where male athletes are raising their hand to say like, I actually don't want to be berated and screamed at like I'm a child. I'm a adult and this has nothing to do with like being a man or a woman. It has to do with sort of basic fundamentals of treating people with respect and challenging ourselves to figure out how to motivate people when you're trying to get them to perform at the highest level without resorting to inappropriate behavior. It sounds so, uh, it sounds so like basic, doesn't it? When you put it like that, it's like, actually, yeah, I I don't really want to be talked like this and it doesn't make me play any better. It's funny how that's become the pervasive culture and well, not funny, but it's interesting how that's become the pervasive culture in like peak athletic performance. Yeah. Well, it used to be that it was normal to see coaches like throwing things and screaming at adults to try to get the most out of them. And, you know, I think the world has shifted again. This is not just in sports. You know, even if you look at the way employment cultural norms have evolved, there are different expectations today than there were 20 years ago. And I think sports is a little bit late to catch up, but we're getting there. You mentioned Michelle Kang earlier. Multi-club ownership is something that we've seen is becoming increasingly common in the men's game. There's not that many multi-club women's groups. I think that might be one of a couple. So do you see them as a problem or do you see them as a strength? I see them as a strength with some potential sort of watch outs that we need to be cognizant of. But overall, I see it as a strength in that the smarter our owners can be about the landscape and the ecosystem, the better it is for all of us. And so let's take Michelle Kang, for example, what she's building around her multi-club investment strategy is a center of excellence around performance, around being able to achieve economies of scale, knowing that there's broader applicability for the investment she's making around women's health and wellness and being able to optimize performance for female athletes. This is something that there hasn't historically been really any or very small investment in. And because she is a business person and recognizes that if she owns multiple teams, she can scale the impact of what she's investing in at the hub of her center of excellence. I think we'll all get the benefit of that. And so I think that's an incredible strategy. And, you know, anyone who meets Michelle knows that she's going to make sure that she achieves excellence and pushes the standard of what's possible for her investments and that she looks at it from a business perspective. And so, you know, for all those reasons, it's great. I think some of the sort of challenges around it, of course, relate to the fact that as we've talked about, like there are places where we do compete with international teams and leagues. And so making sure that Frankly, all of our leagues have appropriate policies in place to protect the integrity of each of our leagues in that context will become increasingly important as all of these consolidated investments begin to become the norm in women's soccer. And I do think we're going to continue to see more of that. I I guess maybe some of that feeds into my next question, because I think one of the problems that's been flagged by players is the increasing load that they're being asked to be put through. You mentioned that you're going to be looking at introducing a mid-season kind of international tournament. We've just come off a 
big World Cup with expanded games. When you have those centers of excellence that are able to kind of look at athletic performance, is this one of the, going to be one of the things they're going to be coming to you about and saying, well, we need to do something about the load on players here, like it's getting a little bit too much. You see regular, quite serious injuries for very senior players, which can't be good for the game. Yeah, well, we hope that there's research that comes from any of the work that any of our owners are doing in this space. And, you know, Michelle King's center of excellence isn't the only place where there's been investment in research. Orlando has invested in an entire ecosystem of data collection that is really focused on helping them to understand how to optimize performance and reduce injury. Same in Utah, our new ownership group with the Utah Royals. So we're starting to see more and more of that. Our partners at Nike are doing some work in this space that I think will ultimately scale across our industry. I know FIFPRO released a research report around this, and I think this is a place that we're going to need to all pay a lot of attention to because the players are our product. We need to do everything we can to ensure that they have long careers that allows them to perform at their best and that therefore, in turn, our business can thrive. We can't just continue to haphazardly add games without understanding the unintended consequence. You know, our hope is that this is something that FIFA helps us to think about more holistically because, you know, they sit at the top of the pyramid that frankly should have visibility into, you know, what I describe as the left hand, right hand, left hand being country, right hand being club. And within club, for example, in Europe, you're not just talking about your club. You're talking about Champions League, which is controlled by UEFA. You're, there's all these different entities that have a singular focus on what they're executing, but there needs to be more of a focus on the interrelationship between all of these different ventures that the players are being asked to participate in. It shouldn't be the player's job to manage this. This is something that should live at a higher level governance. Are you part of that higher level of government? Are you the ones going to be going to FIFA and saying, listen, guys, this is too much. Like, I know you want to grow the international game. We want to grow the club game, but we can't do this at the risk of the people who ultimately are performing on the field. We've begun to have those conversations with FIFA and with CONCACAF, with US soccer. It's an interesting ecosystem as someone who doesn't come from the global football world in that the clubs are such an important component to the growth of the game in that we fund and are responsible for the daily training environment of these athletes and therefore need to be able to monetize the business. Otherwise, we won't be able to bring in quality investors who are willing to unlock incremental investment. Yet, we don't actually have a seat at the table other than when we sort of like elbow our way in and ask for a meeting, which I feel fortunate we have very good relationships with U.S. Soccer, CONCACAF, FIFA, and anytime we've requested to have a meeting, we we get the forum to have the conversation, but we're not actually at the table. Like we are not part of the decision making around that. So we have influence, but not any authority or control. And I recognize that this predates, you know, anything in my world and women's soccer, that this is the system that men's soccer has been built on. It's just a very interesting model where the decision makers are making decisions held accountable by their confederations who are primarily focused on country competition. And it is the clubs who are sort of sitting on the outside. And that's the reason that you see the ECA. And it's the reason you see the World Leagues Forum, because these collective action groups and the trade associations help bring together stakeholders who will hopefully have a bigger influence when they're acting in the collective. And it's the reason that collaboration and communication between all of our leagues becomes so important. I guess there's going to be an interesting inflection point in this when it comes to that Club World Cup. That surely has got to be part of the negotiation of like, well, we can not turn up to this thing that you created if there's not going to be some fundamental change made to the way our athletes are treated. We are hopeful, cautiously optimistic that given the success of our league and in particular the amount of investment coming into our league, which I do think everyone in the entire ecosystem recognizes is a good thing for the sport, that it will give us the opportunity to have meaningful dialogue around what makes sense in the overall calendar.
And that's probably one of the things about women's football that's different. You're shaping a sport in the way that you're not dealing with legacy things that were in men's football. You get a chance to maybe create some of that from a different starting point. Yeah, absolutely. And we can have the benefit of taking the things that have worked well in men's sports and leaving the things that don't make sense for us. And it allows for us to be more innovative and creative in thinking about how we want to build for the future. Okay, lovely stuff. Jessica Berman, I feel like you've probably got a lot of investors ringing you up and asking how I can buy a new uh, new franchise. So I'll let you go. Thank you very much for your time, though. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you.